Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar. We're excited to have the Josh Burson Company joining us today to share their latest research on leading talent strategies of pace setters from the Global Workforce Intelligence Project, powered by Eightfold AI. If you have any questions during today's webinar, please put them in the chat widget located at the bottom of your console. If you experience any technical difficulties, you can also place those in the chat and our team will help troubleshoot. With that, I'll pass it over to our speakers, Kathy Inderez and Stella Iwanidu. Well, that was perfectly said. And hello and welcome, everybody. Good morning, good, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm really excited for you to join us on this very, very exciting um, uh, topic where we're revealing the secrets and the, the specific strategies of what we call pace setters. So we'll go into that in a minute. But uh, let me just introduce myself really briefly, and then I'll hand it over to Stella, and then uh, we'll get started. So Kathy Andras, SVP of Research and Global Industry Analyst at the Josh Burson Company. If you know us, we're a research and advisory company um, that and professional development company for HR. And what I do here in the company is I, I feel I have the best job because I get to talk a lot with the market and with members and with companies and study practices and um, strategies, including what we reveal here for the pace setters. My background is in um, partly management consulting and then 10 years in, as a practitioner and leader in organizations. and. Just to explain my accent, I'm originally from Austria. So so with that, and I live in California right now. So I live in Palo Alto. Stella, over to you. Thank you, Kathy. So hello, global greetings. My name is Stella Ioannidou, weird surname. That's all Greek to you. It's actually Greek. I'm director <laughs> of research at the Joss Bursing Company, leading the Global Workforce Intelligence Project for the financial services. I'm really, really excited to share with you what we are finding in uh, going deeply into the biggest business and talent related strategies of industries right now and uncovering what works. So this is what we're going to be uh, talking about today. Uh, Kathy, over to you to briefly discuss the agenda. Sounds great. Yeah, so we'll start with a little introduction and business context of what we're seeing and why we're even talking about um, pace setters. Um, and then um, Stella is going to talk about what is the Global Workforce Intelligence Project, um, how we're doing this. And then the most, most of the time we'll spend on uh, sharing with you the seven winning strategies of pace setters and how you can become a pace setter. And then hopefully we'll have time for questions or we address all of your questions um, throughout as well. And I see a good um, note already here. Josh Burson knows <laughs> hiring. Well, thank you very much. I take this as a compliment. <laughs> well, like very, very um, encouraging. So let's talk a little bit about um, the business environment. So uh, every year we bring out our predictions for the year. And these are the ones for this year, for 2023. And if I want to sum up these predictions, it's going to be a year of incredible transformation. And we see um, everything from workforce changes, of course, workforce demographic changes to industry reinvention and conversion to skill-based work, hybrid work, of course, uh, well-being focus, learning still a, a big theme. Uh, changing roles of HR. And we're going to touch on most of these themes um, in a little bit as we talk about the pace setter organizations. Uh, this is from a study from um, PwC where they studied, I think, 4,000 CEOs and their perception of business and people challenges. And what they found out is 40% of the CEOs that they studied be believe their company won't be even be in business anymore. And Three quarters of them feel they're not spending enough time on transformation. They're spending most of their time on just operation and just doing the doing. And they can't really focus on what's coming and what's, what's in the future. Also really important to see how important for CEOs and beyond the focus on automation and reskilling is. And we'll actually talk about some of this and how pace setter organizations do this differently. Um, labor market, very, very incredibly tight and people have really employees really have really had it um we've all been just through three years of pandemic and restrictions and closing and opening and hybrid work and remote work and now of course inflation is here and in most of the countries the economy is not growing it's slowing down in most places of the world and um and uh, 
people are just burned out. Many many employees feel they have to do more with less. So engagement keeps declining. It's it has been rising for the last 10 years, and now for the first time since right after the pandemic, it has been declining steadily. And the reason for that is it's a very it's a very uh, challenging time to be working and to also to be in business. So lots and lots of different challenges. Um, Industry transformation is real, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But what we really see here is that digital jobs, the jobs that we've always been talking about, tech jobs, digital capabilities, are no longer just for tech. If you look at all these companies that have been doing layoffs and um, many of the big tech companies, and I live in, in the Bay Area, so it's like 400,000 people, I think, close to that now, uh, where, that have been laid off from the big uh, big tech companies. But people still find a job and actually a good job because every company is now a tech company and banking companies, manufacturing, retail companies, on and on and on, are actually deploying more of the tech people. And we'll talk more about how the pace setters actually have been thinking about that and anticipating that for the last 10 years or so. Under the hood, why is all of this going on? All of this is going on because um, of a thing that we call industry reinvention. So let me talk through this in a little bit. So um, when the internet came on, uh, became a thing basically in the early 2000s, about 20, more than 20 years ago, we thought we need to bring everything online, right? We need to bring, everything was a dot com and I was in the dot com uh, craze that at that time in, in the San Francisco Bay area, everybody brought the, all of their like offering online. But then we thought about when when the like this thing the the phone obviously became a reality. Um, it was not just online services. It became like you need to think about different employee experiences, different supply chain mechanisms. So it became to the thing where you had to do digital transformation. And I think every company had been doing digital transformation at that time. And then in a way, a lot of companies are still stuck stuck in doing digital. But then what happened with the pandemic is um, everybody was able to work anywhere, of course, and every company had to rapidly transform for all of their services to be touchless, to be remote, to be like healthcare companies, for example, brought on televisits. All the banks thought like, well, people were thinking, why do I have to come in a bank? I can't come into a bank and banks were not ready, on and on and on. So every company was um, being digitally disrupted in the pandemic. And now we're in this state where every company actually is merging and every industry is merging with, with every other company. So what's going on under the hood here is um, Amazon, for example, has been going into healthcare, of course, and Goldman Sachs has been trying to go into consumer banking. Ford, for example, has been getting into electric vehicles. And what that means, though, for your company, if you are an auto manufacturer, for example, you don't really know how to do electric vehicles because electric vehicles are still um, are not really vehicles. They are really computers and wheels, as, I, as somebody told me who works in that area. Uh, they said, don't think about it as putting a computer into uh, like an electric uh, computer into a car. Think about it as a computer on wheels. So the skills, the talent models, the operating models, the roles that you need when you are coming from auto manufacturing into electric vehicles, for example, are completely different. And on and on, and healthcare companies need to know digital skills, data skills, um, retail companies go into healthcare delivery. What that means, of course, for, for industries, they don't really know what industry they're in anymore and how to build um, something um, that's future proof. And under the hood for employees, this also means our careers are changing significantly. So our career models are actually much more modular, much more um, like kind of uh, adjustable. And uh, it used to be that when you when you joined a great company that you worked for them for the next, the next 40 years or so and then retired at 65, right? And you went up, up, up in your career and the, the company was your, your career. But then it, uh, you had the internet and with job posting sites, you're like, oh, maybe I can market myself. I can find me a, myself a different job and um, find I can manage my career kind of as a product. And then, of course, um, as the pandemic hit, we could hit work anywhere and our skills became more our careers. And I have two teenagers at home and they look at me and I say, I don't want to work like you. 
I don't want to work in one company. I don't want to work 50 hours, 60 hours in one company. I want to work a little bit for one company. And then I want to go surfing. And then I want to work a little bit for something else. And then I want to go swimming. And then I go home. Um, and so that much more model uh, way. But it changes us, of course, to think about skills in a different way, not just jobs. Because if the skills are the career, how do we know what skills people have what skills people want to build and how do we help them to move into this skill-based model and what that does for us in HR and in talent and talent acquisition and um, learning and development and pay and rewards, any of the HR functions have actually radically evolved to all of these practices that we used to think about as different silos. We thought about optimizing talent acquisition, right? So you're like, okay, this is a, if you can't hire enough people, clearly it's a talent acquisition problem. So we just have to amp up our recruiter skills. We just have to amp up a recruiting machine and we're gonna just hire more people. But guess what? Maybe it's not a recruiting problem. Maybe it's a learning problem because maybe internally you might have people that already have similar skills and you could just train them on to move internally. Maybe it's a talent mobility problem because nobody lets anybody go from their teams. Maybe it's a pay problem because maybe you're just not paying people enough um, to make them come here to your company. Or maybe your pay is not equitable and fair. Or maybe it's a diversity problem because we're not enticing the right um, uh, the right demographic groups that we might want to get into our company. So very quickly it becomes every single problem that you have as a company is not a siloed problem, it's not a talent acquisition problem or a learning problem or a pay problem. They are kind of interconnected. And that's what we mean when we come up with came up with our new operating system for HR. And so this 4R model, which we'll explain a little bit in more detail, this framework really shows that in the center of all of this is actually insights on skills, roles, and organizational solutions. So think about if there was like a little circle in the middle that said, all the skills that you need to build, all the roles that you need to get. Um, and you think about all of these four R's in a connected way. So how can you recruit better? And recruiting, of course, will never go away because it's a fast solution to fill a need. Um, but you also need to think about how do you retain people in a better way? What's the employee experience that you have? What do they need more flexibility? Maybe their pay is not equitable. Maybe it's not fair. Maybe they don't trust leadership. Maybe managers are not uh, uh, working well with them. So the retaining side of things factors into that too. If you think about what skills you need and what skills and roles you you want to build for the future, reskilling of course has already the skills inside of them. So how do you reskill uh, people that might have adjacent skills, transferable skills, into these roles that you need for the future? Uh, help them build the skills through maybe career pathways, and we'll explain more what that is. Maybe you help them be more mobile within the organization. Maybe you help them do gig work, project work in the organization. And then you also have to think about redesigning the work itself. So how, work redesign sounds maybe a little bit scary, but what it re just means is looking at every job, decomposing it, and thinking about how can we help people do the best that they can with the skills that they have. In healthcare, they call this working at the top of license. And what that really means is everybody is doing the job that they are uniquely qualified for. And if you think about your job, for example, the jobs that you're doing, how much time do you spend on things that you are uniquely qualified for? And that usually is the work that gives you energy, that you are more easier to easier to retain and also easier to recruit and easier to reskill. So all of these things kind of go together, and that's what we are building on our, with our Global Workforce Intelligence Project. So over to you, Stella, to talk a little bit about what that project is. I know, Kathy, you began your discussion saying you have the best job in the world. Actually, this is how I feel like I have the best job in the world working on the Global Workforce Intelligence Project with you and the rest of our team. So what is the Global Workforce Intelligence Project? It's our, let's say, one of a kind uh, research experience when we where we dive deeply into an industry vertical and we try and look at all the tra talent strategies and practices on each and every one of the four R areas. What's going on in each of the um, industries? What practices are working for recruitment? What practices are working in reskilling? What works in a redesign? Why are there challenges in retention? And um, the way that we wanted to uh, work 
our way through this type of research. It's actually a mixed research approach where we combine insights and uh, information from a variety of sources. Starting off from our own um, uh, let's say, um, database of HR insights based on the, the definitive guides that the Joss Persing Company has produced, where we know all the practices, the top performing practices for each of the um, HR strategy quadrant, like what works in learning and development and what works in uh, diversity, equity and inclusion and talent acquisition and uh, um, employee experience and organizational design. So we combine that with the data that we get from our partners in this, the Aidful Talent Intelligence Platform, where we get the time series of the um, skills and the role trends, like, okay, which skills are growing, which are declining, which roles are not going to be around in the next five years because they're being, they've been gradually and gradually uh, collecting less and less people. And we combine these quantitative, let's say, uh, insights with qualitative uh, data and with qualitative insights that we get from interviews with CHROs and um, talent executives from the given industry that we're working uh, to demystify. And uh, we've worked uh, currently, we've published two uh, industry studies, healthcare and banking, which you will be seeing. And very soon, our third uh, research will go live on uh, consumer packaged goods, and you'll know more about that as well. So the type of analysis that we do and the type of uh, things that you uh, should expect to see, let's say, in, a glo in the Global Workforce Intelligence Report is like, what types of, uh, what does the talent mix look like? Uh, what is the talent growth within the days? Which roles are gaining in prevalence? Which skills are gaining in prevalence? Is the talent of the given uh, industry future ready or not? Do they have the skills that they need to take on the business challenge and hand and so on and so forth? And the way that we approach this and the way that we combine a variety of data, both from the market and from within the companies actually goes to prove the whole concept of using talent intelligence to your business's advantage. You know, it will it is the only approach that will help you bring together everything you know, not just about your company per se, but also about the uh, broader ecosystem to see um, how the um, uh, the state of play is shaped and what you can actually do to take on the business challenge at hand. So working through uh, these industries that we have completed our analysis on, we were able to, let's say, uncover a series of patterns, like something that appears to be a connecting tissue, a type of strategy that is actually um, so uh, at, the, at, the, at first we thought it was unique, but after studying industry under after industry, we figured out that there was a pattern. There was a series of strategies that um, were very unique and they were increasingly important into bringing uh, great business outcomes. And Kathy is gonna walk us through what we call the seven winning strategies of Pacers. Yeah, thank you, Stella. And so we're really excited when we saw these these patterns and these strategies, because um, when we looked at the, these two industries, and we'll share some specific examples, we saw that while they're drastically different, of course, healthcare delivery is completely different to banking. If you think about what a bank does and what healthcare, what happens in hospitals and a doctor's office is completely different workforces, completely different industries. We saw that the best companies, we call them pace setters, actually deploy very similar strategies. Um, so we call it, uh, let me first talk a little bit about who the pace setters are. So pace setters are about the maybe 10% of companies that um, have outstanding financial performance they lead in their talent market. They are considered a great place to work by many different metrics, including the workforce perception of them. Um, they also lead in their industry. So those are the ones that have the best products, the best services. They always come out with innovation before anybody else. Um, and then they also have um, our excellence in our a Josh Brisson company systemic HR maturity models. We do maturity models on many of these different practices, including talent acquisition, employee experience, learning and development, and organization and work design. And so we looked at all of these metrics and came up with a set of pace setters, and then more importantly, maybe not just who these companies are, but what do they do? So what they do is 
um, they focus organization and work design on what's really most impactful to them. They continuously transform. They don't do digital transformation, but they're always transforming in a way. They prioritize the right roles and the right skills for the future. And the way they do that is not just through recruiting, but then also through retention and reskilling and mobility that uh, gets them a more sustainable talent advantage. And they also continuously look at redesigning jobs and employment models for the future. And they also have what we call a systemic HR operating model. And also they collaborate across the C-suite. And that might be like maybe the biggest theme here. Um, I was just talking with a group of healthcare leaders um, this week uh, about what we saw with the healthcare study and the, the kind of collaboration across the C-suite blew their mind and they really opened their eyes. So we'll get to that when we, when we talk about that. But so Stella, you wanna tell us a little bit about what we see with the first finding or with the first strategy? Yeah, for example, this is how the focus on organizational design, let's say accountability and goal systems to facilitate change looks like if you um, tap into the talent footprint of the organization. This is uh, uh, the example from our banking study and we actually saw that what paysetter banks had in uh, conjunction in comparison to traditional banks or even to uh, fintechs, they have a very unique talent footprint, which means that they place more people where they need them. In, in particular, paysetter banks have 1.3 times more people in IT operations uh, roles. And by the way, this is business critical for banks because the business, the biggest business related challenge for consumer banks right now is actually their ability to offer great digital experiences to their consumers. So customers who are not able to be served through uh, digital channels to get their banking needs met, they simply go to a bank that uh, can do that or to a fintech that can do that. So. Having more people where you need them is really core, and pay setters have that part um, covered through their talent mix. But it's not just that. It's not like having more people in IT-related roles. It's also about having less people in middle and back office roles. And the way that pay setter banks achieve this is through uh, automation and augmentation of all the um, operations that are uh, include mundane and repetitive tasks so they don't really need so many people and in fact they need 1.6 times less people in these roles compared to their uh, traditional counterparts. And if you think that uh, 1.3 times or 1.6 is like not a significant number, uh, if we give it to the context of, let's say the average US bank, 1.3 times more people actually means 3,500 more people in IT and uh, 1.6 times less people uh, in middle and back office roles due to automation and technology augmentations, actually more than 4,000 people less in uh, this role but we've also uh, we also have a, a very interesting finding uh from the health uh from the health uh, care uh, study on the second finding about prioritizing technology kathy yeah so the, uh, okay sorry I, I think it went one slide too far yeah so uh, interestingly enough uh, healthcare when we talk about healthcare in healthcare, 94% of CEOs say actually that the biggest business problem that they have is not financial pressures, which had been the case for the last 17 years, but it's the shortage of nurses. So clinical people, specifically nurses, uh, I think we've all heard about the nursing shortage. And um, what we found out is how organized pay set a solve for the nursing shortage is significantly different to everybody else in healthcare. So everybody else has a lot less technology roles and a lot less transformation roles needs a lot more operations role and a lot more nurses. So let me unpack that. So when you think about why do the pace setters have five times more web developers? Well, they actually use technology to free up the time of the nurses. And by the way, nurses only spend on average 40 to 50% of their time, sometimes even less, what they call top of lessons, license, actually doing nursing work. All the other time is spent documenting, charting, um, giving discharge procedures, wiping up a mess if somebody got sick, giving medications, all of the things that either technology could do that somebody has to build or 
um, that a lower skilled, lower level person could do. So uh, you need more of these technology roles and more of the transformation roles like these innovation managers, process facilitators, work workshop facilitators to transform the work. So you need then 20% less nurses. And 20% to Stella's point might not seem a lot, but it's actually a lot. If you think about that there's, uh, there, w there will be a need of 6 million nurses in the US, 20% is um, like 1.5 million nurses less, right? So that's a lot of nurses that they will already need less nurses. And that's exactly what they want. You don't want to want more nurses because you just can't find them. You can't just can't attract them. So, so that's why prioritizing technology and transformation roles in the healthcare example. And the way that um, these pay center organizations do that, for example, Kaiser Permanente has a massive, you know, what they call an innovation center where they are testing out innovations in healthcare in with like not with live patients but obviously they're not sick but with patients people that actually can be patients obviously they're not sick and nurses are not performing the work but they're trying out all of these technologies and all of these different automation automation robots for example rounding with like like robot physicians that can be operated from home, all of those kind of things and see what it's like before they deploy it and before the transformation people embed these innovations in, in the flow of work. And this is something that we also saw in the banking example as well. Paysetter banks have significantly more people in technology, okay, but at the same time, they have significantly more people in transformation roles, having more people placed in roles where they get to uh, rethink how work is being done, what can be done to ameliorate and to uh, streamline uh, business processes and operations. What can we do uh, to our modernize our technology stack and our IT systems? How can we create better products? And on top of that, the majority of consumer banks who are at the paysetter level, they need less people in operations and front um, in and front facing roles because at the same time of this uh, digital, let's say, transformation of their infrastructure, they also scale down their retail network. So by design, they need less people in um, operations operations roles. Yeah, so and let's this, go into the third part. Yeah. Yeah, the same thing that we saw in the roles. So we talked about roles now, right? Different roles. We mm -hmm. see the same trend actually in the skills area too. So the mm -hmm. pace setters um, think about skills before they become actually prevalent. So they have a little bit more foresight. They see around the corners to see what skills are actually uh, coming up, which ones are trending up, which ones do we need more of, and they invest into building these skills in the organization so they don't have to uh, like then scramble to find them in the market when they become really hot, basically. So the, um, the healthcare organizations, you see the healthcare example here, that they have uh, 5.2 uh, 5 .2 times more Python skills, for example, the pace setters than everybody else, 3.5 times more healthcare software implementation skills and 2.5 times more HR tech skills. So those tech skills are also uh, really key to the success of healthcare uh, pace setters. And the way to build these skills is also not just buying them from the outside, but building them for the long term. So for example, Bon Secure Mercy, a very large healthcare organization, they have a dedicated career pathway into tech skills for their clinical people. So they, they don't say, well, we don't have, we don't, we, you don't necessarily have to leave your clinical role, but you need to also have more tech skills for your clinical people and they have that dedicated pathway in, in the organization as well. And the same goes through uh, analyzing the skills skills on our banking study. We saw that paysetter banks actually had significantly more of the forward-looking tech skills that were crucial for the industry. In particular, they had more skills related to um, being able to understand and predict customer behavior, being able to predict what is the next best product, being able to aggregate data from multiple sources and be able to know not only what your customer has in your bank as assets, but also what they uh, generally have in other banks and be able to provide them with tailored solutions to meet that. And um, they were also um, 
uh, paysetter banks also ensure that not only they recruited, but to Kathy's point, reskill and grow these uh, core tech, let's say forward looking tech skills from within, because as we said in the beginning, uh, banking is one of the new, uh, let's say tech industries. So you can't really expect to be able to draw this type of um, skill from the market in such a big volume like it's needed. You need to invest into growing them from within. And um, going on to uh, our fourth strategy, I, I would like to present an example from banking. Uh, so the pay setters that we saw don't just have more people where they need them and make sure that they have the right skills that they need right now, but they all also ensure that they know what's going on with the skills right now. They know what type of skills are going to be needed in the future, and they prioritize ways to ensure that they're going to be having the skills that they need on the long run. So if it's a core skill that they currently have and they are going to be needing that in, let's say, five years ahead, they prioritize retention of the staff who have that critical skill. And there is a lot of um, many examples around banks who are great at this. And there is a lot of work being done on the reskilling front and I saw one of the of the comments uh, made by Wynn that said that a significant portion of the employees in IT is uh, for failure to innovate because they are still writing COBOL as their main programming language and of course they are and the paysetter banks who know that let's say this um, programming language from the 60s is not going to be relevant anymore they are prioritizing reskilling efforts of these um, programmers into to uh, Java and other related technologies or Angular, they're going to be around looking ahead. And they are continuously looking mm -hmm. for ways to combine what they know about the skills that are relevant right now and are going to be are growing and are going to be with us in the long run with additional emerging skills for the roles that are important. And they're actually crafting growth and career plans around what, the, what they will need to be needing. And this is an example from um, what the future ready product manager role looks like for banks right now and it's actually a combination a culmination of what we know about product management and digital uh, marketing and data analytics combined with agile and um, user research and rapid prototyping and pace setter organizations in this case banks who know that um, they want to have future ready product managers are actively looking to create these types of roles. ING is such an example. That's great. Yeah. So when we think about the fifth strategy, uh, that's about continuously redesigning jobs and employment models to adapt for the future, because we talked a lot about transformation and how it's important to continuously conform transform. This is from our healthcare study again. And here's um, when we looked in deeply into projections into nursing roles. How many do we have today? How many do we need in, in a couple of years? We actually identified a massive gap of 2.1 million nurses that we're going to be short in 2025 in the U.S. alone. I think in the around the world, it's, it's, uh, it comes down to like 16 million or 15 million. But we just looked at that gap and said, is it even closable? can it even be closed? And the answer is, yes, it can be closed, but not just by increasing supply. So increasing the supply of nurses, you think about how do you recruit nurses? Only about 17% of um, maybe like 13 to 17% uh, can be uh, can be closed with recruiting solutions alone because the, the talent pool just doesn't exist, right? You're fishing in, a, in an empty pond in a way. Um, of course, you need to still recruit, but that's a short-term action retaining a little bit bigger bigger solution so 19 percent uh give or take of that gap can be closed by retention solutions so you're going to think about your employee experience how can you help make the job less stressful maybe you can pay nurses more think about pay equity think about human-centered leadership those kind of things uh, think about different staffing solutions all of that in fact is into retention and by the way retention is a big issue in in healthcare because in the pandemic the job just got so hard and so stressful and all of that so retention is a little bit bigger slice it still helps you increase your supply of nurses 
um, bigger slice in the increasing su supply solution is reskilling. So reskilling people that might not be clinical into clinical roles, people that might lose their job because of automation, receptionists, maybe environmental services people, which are kind of cleaning people, any of those roles that eventually will fade out, um, can you help them if they want to, want to do that, reskill with career path, pathways, with non-layer career pathways, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, into clinical roles. Much bigger slice, 24% give or take of, of that slice can be done with that. But the biggest opportunity of all, and you see this visually here too, is redesigning work and employment models and jobs themselves. So you need less of these nurses because you want to need less of these nurses. But how do you do that? So that decreases the demand. About 40% of that solution comes from redesign by our cal calculation, which we all did um, based on data from Eightfold that goes back in time and goes forward in time. Um, and how do you redesign jobs and employment models? So one example that we have is from Mercy Health, who has a staffing employment solution that they, they really saw that their nurses wanted to have much more flexibility, not just about what schedule they had, but how much they worked overall. They said, maybe I have some parents that I have to take care of. Maybe my children need me more than that. What, whatever they had in their life, they heard the call loud and clear. Uh, people didn't want to just work full time in the organization. They wanted more gigified work in, in their organization. And so they created an app and they called it Mercy Works on Demand, where based on skills, they can now skill-based shift, uh, shift nurses into different shifts by as little as five, five hours a week. And they were a little bit afraid when they started rolling this out because they said, what if everybody takes us up on that offer and we lose most of our nurses to just work so little? But it turns out it was actually a great retention solution too because just knowing that you had the flexibility increased retention a lot. It was also a great attraction tool because people said, wow, if I have the flexibility, if I need to just work five hours a week, not 40 hours, not 50 hours, and still get benefits, still be employed by the company, I want to take that job, not another job. So redesigning work to decrease the demand. And of course, redesign could also go uh, putting in aut automation, medication robots, for robots or cleaning robots or lower skilled people. All of this is redesigning the work itself has the biggest impact on solving that big, uh, big talent gap. And, and the sixth, sixth finding or the sixth strategy that we have is implementing a global integrated system, systemic HR operating model. And we have some examples on how, what, these, what these systemic HR solutions really are. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'll call on the, the career pathways because I saw a question there too from Chad in the beginning, how we define career pathways. And career pathways is actually something that's very key to healthcare, not as key to, to banking as Stella will say, because for different reasons, because career pathways for us, they are not linear. So a career path is, I don't know, you're a financial analyst, you start there, then you get, become a finance manager, then you become a finance director, and then you become a VP of finance, maybe you become the CFO at one day, and then you retire, right? That's a career path. But career pathways are non-linear and they physically map out for people, including education. That's why it's so key in, in healthcare because of course a lot of this healthcare is about certification um, and education. How you become, for example, when you're a receptionist today, how you become a registered nurse if that was always your dream. Right? And it physically maps it out for you. It, it, the organization doesn't just say, oh, you could do that, but if the organization creates that visual path, pathway for you to say, here's your education component, here's your rotation component, here's your practical component, here's your other learning component, here's your shadowing component, here's how you can become first, first level nursing person maybe, and then you move up to an RN. So those career pathways oftentimes even include free education, tuition-free education, where the company actually reimburses uh, upfront the employee for that uh, education component. Because if you are a receptionist, you probably can't afford to lay out $5,000 a semester or something like that for education, right? You just don't have that money. So they also give that that education component in there. So the, the point here is, I think that Stella is going to talk a little bit more about the banking examples. These Systemic HR solutions are uh, really tailored to who the who the organization is and who the in, which which industry you play in. 
um, type of license work, for example, very important in, in nursing and in healthcare. And how do you change and decompose and digitize the work for that? Um, on-site childcare, much more important for healthcare than for banking, for example, because in healthcare, generally, you can't do a lot of remote nursing. I know some organizations are also uh, experimenting with that, but these uh, these examples are really specific to what uh, what is most relevant for your industry. And Stella is going to talk a little bit more about the systemic HR solutions that are key to the banking industry. Yeah, and to your point, Kathy, the quadrants, of course, are the same. The environment, because the broader type of solutions and strategies is the same, but the type of strategies that actually work and seem to be differentiating factors for um, pay setter organizations in banking are totally, completely different. And because I'm seeing Wynn's uh, question about what do you, we mean by work, because we ha we are say showing in this slide that um, pay setter organizations prioritize work, not jobs. It's actually around, they organize around the work that needs to be done, not necessarily what your job title says you should be doing or you should be contributing. Uh, on to. So in banking compared to healthcare, we have a, a very different set of strategies that work. For, for example, and we have a set of um, great stories from uh, leading banks from all around the globe. And mind you that, um, let's say that there is no one bank to rule them all. Like one bank has figured everything out, has doing everything perfectly. However, and at the same time, there are many multiple different ways to start from some place and reach to the place of success. For example, we have a great story um, in our um, GWI series on banking from ING, who have completely redesigned the way that they operate and they have adopted an agile operating model. And now everyone from the CEO right to their teller actually have embraced agility in their ways of working. And if you see how they organize, how their, or let's say their um, operating model looks like, it looks so much more like Spotify than it does an average uh, banks that you wouldn't even expect that this is the um, this is how the organization chart of a bank would look like. And for example, um, there, the span of control is so much different. There is only, in, in most cases, there is only one level of uh, manager between their uh, average software engineer and the CIO. So you see that they prioritize, they, they figure success, they figured um, how to address um, success through tweaking their operating model. However, another leading bank from Singapore, DBS, is actually not an agile organization in the same sense at all. They actually decided that they want to be a digital first bank and they automated and they made sure that they had, they brought technology in to, um, into their redesign, let's say, strategy to rethink what type of systems they are using, what type of technology they're bringing in, how many uh, of the low value add tasks they're automating, what declining capabilities they can outsource to someone else until they die out so that they focus more on building their own digital capability and uh, modernize their infrastructure. So these are two complete, um, let's say, different opposing ways on what we mean when we say um, redesign. And there are other examples, for example, in the um, for, of leading banks that are prioritizing their retention efforts as their their um, go-to systemic HR strategy. For example, Rabobank has a great story of how they bring in work-life balance and flexibility, actually allowing flexibility at the individual level, actually allowing each and every one person to pick what flexibility means for them and um, work their way through that. Um, and even though you know the quadrants are different and the, the quadrants are the same and the the um, uh, let's say the strategies differ, we did see the HR ta the talent strategies differ. We did see that there is um, a common ground in the mentality of how they approach these strategies for all these pay setter organizations. They prioritize uh, teams not hierarchy. So they're most concer concerned about creating the right team to do the job, not necessarily creating connections through the right hierarchical um, levels to ensure that something is done. Um, I mentioned that they organize around the work that needs to be done, but they also work consistently on the employee experience, not so much about the output. The output will come if the experience is great. They work so much more on the growth of the talent 
through other ways, not only promotion, so growth in a broader sense, the sense of professional growth, learning growth, upskilling, et cetera, and they emphasize a lot on culture. And last but not least, Kathy? Yeah, and so the last one is that collaborating across the C-suite, and so when we go back to healthcare, yeah, and I think about that nursing shortage, which was the biggest problem that we we identified in healthcare. That's gonna like really ha hamper the success of healthcare organizations, but even society overall. If you think about that, um, you can't do this alone. You can't do this alone in HR. Of course, you can't work. You can work on the systemic HR practices within HR. You, I'd argue even those require collaboration with IT and all of that. Every dollar that you'll spend on IT, you got to think about what do we spend it on? Are we spending it on something that really helps us solve that big problem? Or is it something that takes us away from solving this big problem? So IT, of course, really important. Collaboration between the CHRO and IT, very, very important to help uh, provide that te technology enablement, provide the medication robots, provide um, AI workflows, for example, AI scheduling tools, AI um, like charting uh, support. Um, and in HR, of course, you got to think about how do we redesign the work? Because just because the tool is there doesn't make um, the, the work changed, if you want. So, for example, we talked with one hospital system and they said we've had medication robots um, in standing in the corner uh, because our galleyways are too small and they can't come through. And IT says, I'm done with this because we deployed the robots. And everybody said, well, whose job is it to actually make sure that the, the robots get deployed in the work? Because surely the nurses can't make this happen themselves because um, they're busy providing the care. So. Uh, CIO needs to be on board. CFO, of course, has to be on board. And all the CFOs that we talked with in, in healthcare space actually laser focused, especially on the pace set of organizations, on, on solving for the nursing crisis because they know financially it's untenable too. Because what they have to do if they don't have enough nurses in house, they have to go to agency nurses that make three times more than your in house nurse. Um, so financially, it's it's ruinous for them, and they can't pass on the say, the the cost to the consumer because the consumer are the patient. A lot of times, it's the government that pays for it, right? So a lot of times, you can't pass that on as you do in another business. CEO is very very important because even if you are, for example, uh, transforming the work of nurses, and then you can could go down um, to less nurses needed in in a hospital setting. There's a uh, patient. Uh, patient um, uh, nursing ratios that are dictated nationally, statewide, locally, uh, lots of regulations that the CEO really needs to work on to change these because otherwise he'll always be hampered by that. And of course, CEO, the chief nursing officer, the clean, uh, chief operations officer has to be on board with this too because in the end of the day, nothing happens if it doesn't get deployed in the real life, in operations, in the nurses. Um, day-to-day -day life, if you want. So uh, very important that all of them are laser focused and working together to address the biggest challenge that they have in this industry. And the same goes with banking. This is not when we talk, where we discuss about how consumer banks address the biggest business related challenge. This is not a CHRO issue alone, although the underlying, let's say, enabler that can help them solve this problem lies within talent. However, you need to work together with the COO for operational enablement and the CFO to ensure that the, the focus is prioritized for banks in digital transformation and the CIO for a technology enablement and the CIO for digital transformation sponsorship. And this goes to, without saying to strengthen Kathy's point that um, the the big the let's say the number one thing if you want to start from somewhere in becoming a pace setter uh, organization would be to build a cross-functional center of uh, excellence around talent intelligence and bring in various perspectives from around the organization and ensure that you have identified the critical challenge to focus on and that you have consensus on what you're working on, why you are working on that, and you are uh, working under the shield of support of an aligned um, C-level 
um, let's say, team. And after you have identified what you want to, uh, what is the most critical talent challenge to focus on, the next step would be to analyze, okay, what what's uh, going on with roles and skills? How, what does um, our talent footprint look like? What skills are gonna be around or what roles are gonna be around looking ahead? Do we have what it takes to do we need to prepare for a, a rapidly changing future that we are not, uh, let's say, um, uh, set up right now? And then, af then, and only after then, you've ad identified the roles and the critical challenge. Do you go and determine what solutions work for your organization, choosing from one or more of the four R quadrants, and then work your way back? For to across the company to plan, design, develop, and implement these uh, solutions and ensure that through the use of um, adequately set up KPIs that you measure the success of these iterations and you continuously strive to improve. If you remember, Kathy mentioned this in the beginning, pace and organizations are not, they don't have a digital a transformation project. They have the mentality of continuous growth and transformation. They're in continuous, they they um, in, are in continuous sync with changing market conditions and they're reinventing and rethinking what can be done, what can be done better, how can we change, where can we um, change. And becoming, um, through becoming, through our becoming a pay setter, let's say, uh, work so far, we've um, identified three types of problems that maybe are present or prevalent within the, your organization. Maybe you have some of them or one of them, maybe you have all of them, but the way that we uh, have seen the, this industry so far, you may come to uh, identify one or more of the following three types of uh, talent problems. Maybe you have a skills gap. You're missing key skills and capabilities for something that's important for your business. For example, in banking, this is the digital skills and the digital skills and roles are rapidly changing. And this is where you should prioritize in shifting your talent mix. Or maybe you're like healthcare, you have a capacity gap. You don't have enough people where you need them in their healthcare's case, the nursing gap. And even though the skills and the roles are somewhat changing, not super swiftly, what you should be emphasizing on is redesigning your, the way that you operate to decrease demand for this scarce talent rather than expecting to be able to attract more of them because there is a problem on the initial, um, let's say, supply of this talent at the market. So no matter how much you try to recruit your way out of this, there is no, rec there is no one, um, let's say, strategy around recruitment that will solve this for you. Or maybe you have the skills that you need, you have the people that you need, but you're working on the wrong things. So your business unit is underperforming. This is what's going on with technology right now. And that explains for a lot of all the discussions that are around this industry and the later in the uh, in the last few months. And in this case, what uh, you should be focusing on is efforts around reskilling and, uh, and redesign of work to increase talent mobility in terms of simply letting people go like where can we uh, redistribute the talent how can we ensure that we have the talent that we need working on the things that they should be um, working on and um, Kathy, let's uh, w uh, walk us through the next steps of becoming a pace setter. yeah yeah thank you so so the next step on becoming a pace setter is you get to really understand what roles do you have and what roles do you need and how do they cluster together? Understand what skills do you have? What skills are trending? What skills are more important and less important? What skills have been trending over time more important and less important? What does, in this case, we have like the profile of a high performing nurse uh, in there from a skills level. Stella talked about the, one, an example in banking. And then what solutions can you bring through talent intelligence? And we use the eightfold talent intelligence platform for all of this because it really gives you like that. What's really powerful there is the time series. So you can't just look at one moment in time, but for example, on roles, what we did with the Eightfold Talent Intelligence Platform is we looked, and it's very small here, but we looked at when you clustered all these roles in healthcare into six different groups, how fast are they growing or shrinking? And that really gives you some great insights and to say, well, if somebody is in a shrinking and a declining role, like uh, an administrative support role, for example, that will eventually be replaced by uh, like 
technology systems or something like a receptionist, uh, online check-in, how do we get them into the future roles, the, the rising roles as well? So that's really, really important. The skills is the same way. What are the skills that you need for the future? So you can build for those, not just today, but then also build for like a longer, longer time up front and then build the right organization solutions. And we had a similar story, Stella, for, for banking, if we want to go quickly through that. I know we're almost yeah, out of time. <laughs> Yeah, let's go quickly through and because the, I want us uh, to emphasize more on the maturity, Kathy. Okay, great. And I can talk about that really quickly and then I'd love to hear yours mm. as well, Stella. So um, what we also do, and you'll see that from healthcare and then also for um, for banking is you got to understand when you want to become a pay setter, how good are you in these four art processes? How effective is your organization? And uh, how effective is the industry overall? And what we found out in healthcare, not surprisingly, maybe, um, very, very good in recruiting because they have to be, because they have so many opens all the time. We talked with some of them that have 500 recruiters and the latest recruiting tech uh, because they just constantly have to fill the, the feed the machine, basically, fill the need. Uh, not all that great in retaining people and a lot of opportunity in reskilling, learning and development because they have to focus a lot on compliance training because um, the skills are changing so quickly and, and like their medical skills, the clinical skills are changing very quickly. If you think about COVID protocols and everything else, you always have to certify people there. So they are not all that great in a more strategic reskilling area. Um, you want to talk about banking? Yeah, and in banking, for instance, we saw that the majority of banks were trying to address the digital skills gap. We're actually emphasizing the recruitment part, where we saw that actually they're now super sophisticated compared to the market. They're kind of or more or less at par. There was more to be done within banking at the retention part, the reskilling part, the redesign. They're stronger in their maturity level, uh, consumer banks right now. So this goes to show, and this is the Type, this type of analysis helps you prioritize and see where your strengths are so that you can play to your strengths when you are uh, on your way in, to becoming a pace setter organization. Yeah, and so just to close it off, um, we did this for for the, these industries in our company, um, just using the, the, the massive database from Eightfold and also our data set where we know what does actually good recruiting look like? What does we call that human center talent acquisition? What does great retention look like? And we have our definitive guide on employee experience that we call the irresistible organization. So how do you create that irresistible organization where people never want to leave? Um, how do you create growth in the flow of work, which is for us the reskilling side of things? It's not just about learning, it's really about growing the career and growing the skills that the organization needs, but then also that um, people want to amplify. And then uh, you also can think about redesigning work and organizational models and organizational structures with our guides to organization and work design. We call that the journey to agile. And it's really about how you can be agile and accountable at, at the core. Um, the last uh, question I want to just pose to you before we open it up for maybe a couple of questions more that we haven't addressed yet. What if you could do this for your organization? Because we did this for these industries. We've done it now for two or three industries. Uh, and we're not a huge company, but it just took some work to, uh, to basically get the right data set and then really put our mind to identifying what the problem is and then working through um, identifying that problem and uh, like applying the pace setter kind of principles to it. So um, want to awesome. like maybe take a couple of questions that we haven't addressed yet. Yeah, let's take a quick question from uh, Carter, who is asking uh, for pace setter banks, are the individual in the back and middle uh, office reskilled or and more highly compensated versus other banks? I will not speak to compensation, especially in the banking sector, because that's a pretty um, unique topic, especially for banking nowadays. But I will be saying that a pace setter um, practices within banking did emphasize uh, re-skilling of these um, workers. And the majority of one of the talent strategies that works within banking is actually the use of talent marketplaces. So through the use of the strategy of talent marketplaces, they're able to tap into their existing talent and carve for them career pathways um, generated and designed through reskilling to address uh, this. 
Uh, and there's another question. I think you can take this one, Kathy, from Anita. How do you drive the shift when growth is only viewed as promotion or role change? Yeah, and I, I take it that this is about when employees only see growth as promotion and role change. I mean, honestly, we ha that's not what we see from all the data, that, from, especially from the younger generation. Most of them actually see growth as just growing your skill set because they think about this new model of the career. Um, and as, as I showed the career 4.0, basically where your skills are your career. So if you feel, if people feel they're building the skills that they want to build, putting it in people's hands, like with things like talent marketplaces, for example, where they can decide which skills they want to amplify, but are also matching it with where the organization wants to go. That's really where, where the magic happens, because then when people say, I'm not working on something that's kind of a dead end thing, it's something that's future proof that the organization values, and then uh, that I can apply immediately to just learn something. Um, that's why, by the way, also most people leave when they don't see a lot of career growth, but career growth is not just up, it can also be very lateral as well. So I think with that, um, do you want to yeah. close it off? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much from Kathy and me. And uh, over back to Callie for closing remarks. Thank you for being with us today. Yeah, thank you. Callie? Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to Kathy and Stella for an incredible presentation. If you've missed part of today's webinar or want to share with a colleague, the on-demand recording will be available immediately after this via the link you used to log in today. And we will also have the on-demand recording available on Eightfold's website. Thanks so much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for joining us.